So in Psalms chapter 9, it starts out there in verse 1, reading, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O Most High. And when is he going to do all this? When is he going to praise him? When is he going to show forth all his marvelous works? When is he going to be glad and rejoice in him? When is he going to praise his name as the Most High? Well, he's going to do it where he says there in verse 3, When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou sattest in the throne, judging right. So we see here is David, of course, was one that, if we've been following along in 1 Samuel, was one that was pursued by an enemy, Saul. You know, he was one that was on the run. And yet, in the midst of all that, he was still able to praise God, to lift God up. And because he knew that at the end of the day, the enemies are going to turn, be turned back. They are going to fall and perish at his presence. That he is going, his right is going to be maintained. His cause is going to be maintained by God who is judging right. So, you know, what I get from this is that when we go through tribulation, when we go through difficult times, when we go through trying times, when, you know, our enemies are pursuing us in a way, you know, speak, in a sort of speaking is that the things we should be focusing on are not getting back at them or how we're going to, you know, uh, an exact vengeance upon them or show them what's up. You know, the thing that we should be doing in a time like that is praising and preaching rather than seeking to avenge ourselves. You know, that's a time to, to realize that God is on our side, that we can trust in him and that if we just put our trust in Him, that everything's going to turn out just fine. Everything's going to turn out the way it should. And the Bible says that all things, you know, all things work together for good to them that are called that to them that love God, that to them that are called according to His purpose. You know, if we love God and, and we're we're trying to, uh, you know, live for Him and serve Him and we're praising Him, you know, God's going to work out all these things. You know, and of course we can't really bring that up without thinking about, you know, again what's taken place recently over in you know uh, in El Monte, you know. And, and, and the way the folks are over there are handling it is great, you know. Their, boat, their building literally gets blown up, you know. It wasn't an explosion. It was, blew up, it was blown up, okay, which caused an explosion. A lot of people are reporting that conveniently, just saying, oh, there was an explosion. You mean somebody threw a bomb in it, <laughs> you know. But th well, wait, look at the way they're handling it. They're going forward. They're praising God. They're continuing to preach. They're continuing to reach out to the lost. And they're trusting God that everything is going to work out just the way it should. And that's what David's here doing here. And, you know, because the heathen, they have what's coming to them. And like it says there in the latter end, you know, they're laying a net for their own feet. They're going to be taken in their own trap. You know, they're going to go and light off an IED in a Baptist church, and then the FBI is going to get involved, and hopefully, if justice is served, going to find out who did it. And they're going to end up going to jail and so on and so forth. You know, it's going to turn on them. So often, you know, when God's en the enemies of the Lord plot against God's people, it so often backfires, no pun intended, okay? It backfires on them. They say, oh, we're going to go down there with the news crew. You know, we're going to put you on blast on, on social media. We're going to let the whole world know what you preach. It's like, great, please do that, you know? And I'll just continue to preach and to praise God and let, watch God just be glorified through all of it. So when we're going through difficult times, when we're being pursued, when we're Having, uh, you know, when, when we're, we need to trust in the Lord, you know, we can just focus on praising God rather than trying to avenge ourselves. Look at verse 5. He says, Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. I can't do any of that. You know, you and I, we're limited. You know, yeah, maybe we can have some smart reply on, on some social media. You know, we can tell these people what we think. You know, maybe we can have some clever statement to put together or something like that but here's the thing can you rebuke the heathen i mean can you just put all the heathen to shame can you bring all those that are lifted up low can you base everyone no but god can can you destroy the wicked no but god can and will and has can you put out their name forever just make them a bygone you know part of history that's just nobody even remembers no but you know who can god so when we're like David, we're going through these tough times, you know, we're being pursued, we're going through persecution, the best thing we could do is just continue to preach, continue to pray, and continue to praise the Lord for the fact that He's going to deliver us and that He is going to exact vengeance. I mean, God is going to, you know, God's vengeance here is as good as done. I mean, He's saying, thou hast rebuked, you know, past tense. 
Thou hast destroyed, past tense. Thou hast, past tense, put out their name forever. I mean, the heathen are still around, but you know what? It's as good as done. You might as well just say, hey, you know, they're already, their, their fate is sealed. And we could just trust in that. And then he begins here, of course, to address the wicked. He says, O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. And thou hast destroyed cities, their memorial is perished with them. Now, it's kind of, a, kind of hard to understand exactly what's being said here, but I believe the first half he's kind of talking about, you know, that, O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities. You know, the way I'm reading it, I kind of think about that part about thou hast destroyed cities is that maybe he's talking about what the Lord's going to do. You know, he's saying here, thy, you know, enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. You know, what you're doing is, is going to be finished forever. And then thou hast destroyed cities, their memorial is perished with them. So I kind of think the last half of that verse is more about he's talking about what God's going to do because of the fact that, you know, their destructions are coming to an end. Why? Because thou hast destroyed cities and their memorial is perished with them. I mean, where would their memorial be? It would be, you know, in their city. You know, we think about the memorials that we have here in Washington, D.C., state capitals, you know, different national parks and things like that. You know, we have that kind of a thing. And it's, you know, in the midst of the people, it's within their nation. So he's saying there, you know, thou hast destroyed cities, Lord, you know, O Lord, and he could put the Lord in there. Their memorial is perished with them because thou hast destroyed them. <coughs> he says, thou hast destroyed cities. You know, and that's, you know, and people, the, the Psalms are great because they give us just a, you know, a wonderful, uh, a full bodied view of what God is like. If you, you know, this morning I was talking about the love and the compassion and the long suffering of God. And we went to Psalms, didn't we? We have a lot of great psalms about God's mercy and grace that are in the psalms. But you know what? That's not all that God is. God has, you know, he's multifaceted in his character. And he's saying here, you know, thou hast destroyed cities. Meaning, you know, God has wiped out entire groups of people. <laughs> There's been entire nations, cities that have been subject to God's wrath. You know, be, oh, that's the God of the Old Testament. It's like, well, let, you know, go to Revelation and, and read about what he does to the entire earth. He just starts to pour out his wrath and whole, you know, nations are being wiped out in, by the wrath of God. You know, God is very long-suffering and merciful, but, you know, he also has a wrathful, vengeful, righteous side where he judges and does, and does judgment. You know, we could think of examples of the past of him destroying cities. Of course, probably one of the first ones that, you know, probably comes to everybody in mind is Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, there's a city that he wiped out. And again, we talked about this morning, how even then, you mean when, they, when a cities that were called in the scriptures exceedingly wicked, they were sinners before the Lord exceedingly, that even then the grace and mercy of God allowed him to, allowed Abram to barter with him and say, hey, if there be ten righteous, wilt thou spare it? He said, I will. I'll spare it for ten's sake. You know, and, he, and he whittled them all the way down from fifty. But at the same time, of course, we know the story, there weren't ten there. There was Lot. And he went ahead. So again, it's showing us that God has this dual nature. He's, he's, he's a full faceted individual. So we think Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, how it was destroyed. And you know, not just Sodom and Gomorrah, if you read in Jew, it's Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. You know, it wasn't just those two cities. It was them and the suburbs. You know, God just destroys entire cities. You can think about Egypt, right? When the, uh, the Pharaoh's servants came unto him and said, you know, knowest thou not that Egypt is destroyed? You know, God is one that, that destroys. He, he, people get this idea that God is just, you know, like what was that song that was so popular? I think it was, I'm going to, probably half the room won't even know what I'm talking about. You know, I think it was Bette Midler. <laughs> God is watching us from a distance. Blasphemy. God is not watching us from a distance. We read it this morning. God knows our inmost secret thoughts. God knows the thoughts of our heart. God is involved in what goes on in the affairs of man. He will involve himself. He's not just, you know, some distant being who just, you know, doesn't, you know, is just aloof to everything that's going on in the world. And it might, we might seem that, it might seem that way, we might feel that way sometimes when we see the heathen rise up, the wicked rise up, and they're, you know, and, and it seems like, where is God? You know, but we have to remember what God has done in the past and what he will do in the future. 
And don't mistake the long-suffering God or the long-suffering of the Lord for passiveness because that's not who he is. You know, we think about Egypt. We think about Sodom and Gomorrah. We could think about Jericho. Remember Jericho when they went over the River Jordan and the walls came down and they burned everything with fire. You know, God used man to do that. Think about Jerusalem. You know, when Jesus said to them, you know, once, uh, see, seest thou these great buildings, there shall not one left, be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. He said, uh, he said of Jerusalem that they shall lay, uh, lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. You know, and that's prophecy that was fulfilled in 70 AD when the Romans came in and sacked Jerusalem and burned it to the ground. You know, you say, well, those are past examples. Maybe God today is just kind of backed off, you know. But I believe even if you look through history, you know, you'll see examples that, that aren't in Scripture. You know, I, I remember when I was in uh, elementary school, I was in this program called Odyssey of the Minds. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that. But it was like this extracurricular thing you did after school where you could get involved. It was like a competition. You know, you'd get in these science competitions, and then there was like this historical play acting kind of thing, which is what I got involved in. And we did a reenactment of the destruction of Pompeii. You know, we learned a lot, a lot of Pompeii. The, the science kids, you know, they, they nerded out and just made like a volcano and had a little model. And it was probably cooler in the long run. But, you know, we, I, I had a, we made fake swords and armor. And at the, the end of the, the act was me battling another kid. And we were trying to debate about who was going to win. Like, which we were the, so, the only two people left in Pompeii. And we never, got to we never decided who was going to win. And I think we both ended up stabbing each other at the same time. And then we looked at each other and we both fell over dead and that was the end of it. But, but it was about Pompeii. And, you know, that's a great example of God's wrath because that was a very wicked city. I mean, they, it was, it's on par with Sodom and Gomorrah. The things, you know, the same filth and, and, and sin that they were involved in then was what took place in Pompeii. You know, and it was at the base of a volcano and they all got destroyed. I mean, could God have just put his finger in that volcano and gone, nope, I'm going to let him get right. You know what God did? He set that thing off and let him just get wiped out. You know, and there was, uh, I'm trying to think of that other example. And, you know, some, when they came back from the Jamaica mission strip, I can't remember the name of the city, but there was a city in the, in the port there that was like, the mo like it was just, even the locals there today just talk about how wicked it was. Like all this gambling and prostitution and just murder. It was just a lawless city. And then one day, I think it was just like a sinkhole or something opened up and the whole thing fell into the ocean. You know, God does that kind of thing. God, even to this day, you know, judges. I mean, think about what's going on in our country. You know, tell me that God isn't judging this nation? Of course he is. All the things that are happening, all the uh, things that are taking place, it's just that people don't want to connect the dots anymore. You know, they say, well, I don't think that type of thing happens. Well, what about the future then? In, you know, Babylon, where God's going to destroy Babylon, and to the point where it says there in, in Revelation chapter 18, verse 23, and the light of a candle shall no more at all be more, uh, shall, uh, a candle shall no more at all be in thee. That never again. There's not, no one, there's, no one's going to inhabit it again forever. That's how badly God is going to destroy this, uh, this Babylon. You know, which, if you haven't figured out who that is, there's a great film back there called Babylon USA. <clears throat> and you say, well, what's the point here? Well, this should just remind us all of how temporal this world really is. You know, and you think about all the great leaders and things like that. You think about the monuments that they built in themselves. Like we were talking about Mount Rushmore out there. You know, these great leaders, you know, our forefathers. Let's see who's, who, who knows them all, okay? I've been there like six times. I probably can't. Is it four? There's four guys on Rushmore, right? You got uh, Washington, Lincoln, Rez uh, Roosevelt. Jefferson. Did I get it? Okay, I, got, I see some heads nodding. All right. I should. I'm from there. You know, I lived like less than an hour away from that place when I was growing up. But you think about, oh, this monument, these men are going to be remembered forever. No, they won't. Eventually, that's all going to, you know, the wind or something's going to wear that down. It's all going to fall apart and crumble. God's going to, you know, judge the earth. God, remember, God is going to, you know, he's going to melt the elements with a fervent heat, it says. And one day God's just going to torch this whole thing. None of it's going to remain. All those monuments in Washington, all the monuments all over the world, God's going to, they're all going to be wiped away. And I guarantee you when we're up in heaven for a thousand years, you're not going to think about, 
oh, let's talk about Jefferson. Let's talk about Franklin. Let's talk about all these great leaders. No, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be the farthest things from our mind. And it's all going to be about the Lord and heaven. And, you know, so all this should just remind us, you know, that the God, when he, his wrath being poured out upon cities and nations in the past and even modern and even today and in the future, you know, that should just remind us that all these things are temporal. You know, that we should not allow ourselves to become entangled with the affairs of this life. And that we should get, be more concerned with what David did. You know, praising, preaching, and, and, and lifting up the Lord. It says there in verse 7, But the Lord shall endure forever. You know, God's going to destroy all these heathens. God's going to destroy all these things. But who's going to last forever? The Lord. So who should we be more concerned with pleasing in this life? Should we be more focused on serving man and building up some kind of legacy? Or should we be more concerned about pleasing him who's going to endure forever? You know, that should affect the way we live our lives. Go over to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 6, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. You know, there's going to be a, a lot of people that just say, Oh, the Lord's not coming. It's, it's going to be hundreds of years. Let's just go about our merry way and just live life the way we want. Not be concerned with the things of God. You know, some people are, it's going to creep up on them like the thief in the night. All of a sudden, the tribulation kicks off. All of a sudden, it's the Antichrist. Like, oh, you know, what, what, let me get this back out. Where was that again? Let me, let me pay attention now. Well, you know what? It might be a little too late for that. <clears throat> he says, The day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall, burn, uh, shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. All those things that man, you know, lived, you know, all those things that man built and exalted himself in are just going to be gone in a moment. The seven wonders of the world, all these great monuments that we think are just going to stand the test of time. God's going to just light them up and they're going to be gone in a moment. So how should that affect us? Well, verse 11 tells us, See, seeing that then that all these things shall be dissolved. I love the, how he just describes it. It's not even going to be hard for him. It's going to be like dissolving something. It's like dropping an alka seltzer in, in a thing of water. That's like that's God's going to just do There's psh, that easy for him. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? You know, understanding that everything in this world is temporal, that this is all going to go away, the wicked and all their works and all the thing, and man and all his achievements are going to be gone. It ought to affect the way we live. We ought to see. We ought to uh, see what manner of people we ought to be in all holy conversation and godliness. You know, it should, conversation is your conduct, how you conduct yourself in this life. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt away with fervent heat. Go over Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seventeen. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seventeen. You know, David got, was more focused on just praising God, even in the midst of his affliction, even in the midst of his persecution. You know, he stayed focused on the Lord and serving him because he understood that all that is temporal. All that's going to pass away. God is going to, you know, he, he's, gonna, he's going to destroy the, the cities. Their memorial is going to perish with them. You know, God is going to destroy the wicked. wicked. God is going to put out their name forever. And it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, for our light affliction is but for a moment. You know, and, and anything that we go through in this life, you could just chalk it up as that light affliction. You know, Paul said he, that, that the sufferings of this present world cannot be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, whatever we go through in this life, when we get to heaven, we're just going to say, worth it. Well, you know, we could go some, through some great suffering, some horrible trials, some great persecution, and we get there, we're going to say, well, that was a light affliction. You know, this doesn't even compare to the glory, the weight of glory that, that we're going to receive. He says, Our light affliction, which is for but a moment, worketh uh, uh, for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I mean, talk about a good return on your investment. 
I mean, it, 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 he's saying the weight of the, the eternal weight of glory exceeds the, the suffering that we even went through. It's not like God is going to go, oh, you went through this much suffering, you get this much glory. It's going to say you went through this much suffering, you know, you're going to get this much glory. It far exceeds it. We can't be compared. While we look at the things which are not seen. See, this is the people that have this attitude. You know, Paul had this attitude, this mindset, this understanding. And it wasn't just ingrained in him. It wasn't just automatic. It was because of verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen. Why was Paul able to say all that? Because he didn't look at the things which are seen. He did not look at the things which are temporal. He was able to see afar off. <clears throat> it always reminds me of that story when Moses is leading out the children out of, the, out of uh, Egypt and he comes to the Red Sea. And, you know, and it says they lift up their eyes you know, and that's when they started to lament because all, all they saw was the Red Sea. All they, looked, they lifted up their eyes and they looked, they saw Pharaoh's army. You know, if they just looked a little higher, <laughs> if they just kept lifting up their eyes and looked to heaven, you know, maybe that story would have been a little different. <clears throat> Looking for and hate, excuse me, where was I? He says in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, you know, we need to get our eyes off the things of this world and start thinking about the things which are not seen. <clears throat> but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. So that's everything. <laughs> you know, everything we look at, the things which are seen are temporal. You know, you can't, I mean, you could say the word of God, but I mean, this physical book even is going to, is temporal. The words that are in it are eternal. We understand that. And there will always be the word of God. I mean, outside of that, What's going to last forever in this world? You can't, no, nothing. Even the earth itself is going to be burned up. Even the elements that are in it, everything is just temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. And you say, well, why is it that people have such a hard time wrapping their mind around this and, and you know, getting their priorities right? It's because it takes faith to believe that. It takes faith to believe in things that you can't see. You know, faith is the evidence of, of things which are not seen, okay? So we live our lives in light of eternity and in the knowledge that God will set things right. That's what David was doing, I believe, in the psalm. You know, he, he did not look at the things which are seen. He saw the wicked, he saw the heathen, he saw his enemies, those that rised up against him. You know what? But unlike, you know, the Israelites in Moses' day, he lifted his eyes a little higher and he looked at the things which are not seen. He lived in light of eternity, and in the knowledge that God is going to set all things right. And knowing that he's going to make everything the way it should be. It says in the latter half there, verse 7, He hath prepared his throne for judgment. So why isn't God judging anyone? Well, he's prepared the throne. It's coming one day. You know, he is going to deal with the heathen. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Go to Revelation chapter 20. You know, I believe this is prophetic. You know, God, yes, in a sense, is going to judge here and now. He's going to judge the heathen now. He even judges his own children now, you know, through chastening, so on and so forth to talk about this morning. But, you know, there is coming a literal day when God is going to ju literally judge a literal throne, literal judgment. I don't know if there's going to be a gavel involved, but there's going to be guilty, guilty, guilty. It says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Again, just this idea that everything is temporal. The only thing that is eternal is God. He is the only one that's going to endure forever. Verse 12, And I saw the dead and the uh, small and great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. You know, when David in the Psalms is saying he hath prepared his, for his, his, his throne for judgment, that's not just platitudes. That's not just him waxing eloquent. That's not just poetry. That's literally going to happen one day. Go to verse 9 in, in, in Psalms chapter 9. He says, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed. A refuge in times of trouble. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord, which, uh, which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. You know, <coughs> it, God is going to judge. You know, God is going to destroy. God is going to judge. 
but you know we can't we don't want to just cross our arms and just say well they got it coming that's that i guess you know that that is looking at things which are seen that is not living life in the view of eternity that kind of attitude is not seeing things which are invisible you know if we understood the, 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 the reality of God's judgment and the reality of hell and eternity, and we lived our life like that, you know, we would, uh, we would sing praises to the Lord, which dwelleth in Zion. And what's the latter end there, saying verse 11? Declare among the people his doings. And to me, I just read soul winning, preaching the gospel. I mean, it's, it, it's great that we have a refuge for the oppressed, but what about those that don't have it? You know, what about the saved that are just being tossed to and fro? With every, the unsaved, excuse me, I should say, that are being taken captive by the devil at his will. You know, it, it reminds me of the illustration is, you know, a cat playing with a, with a mouse. You know, that's how some people live their lives out there today. They can't explain it. They can't explain why life is, you know, always so difficult for them, why things keep happening, or they can't get over this sin. Or it's because they're, they're in the clutches of the devil. They're in the clutches of sin. You know, they don't have that refuge. They don't have a place to put their trust <clears throat> so yeah, let's sing praises, but let's also declare among the people his doings. You know, we need to get people in God's favor. If we're going to live with eternity in mind, if we're going to see that which is invisible and not stay focused on the temporal, then we need to get people in God's favor. And how do you do that? By getting them saved, by preaching them the gospel. <clears throat> You know, it reminds me of Jude. You know, that's, this, is, this is a great picture of soul winning. This is what we're doing when we go out there. You know, some, you, you can look at soul winning and just say, well, you're just bugging people. It's Sunday afternoon. And yeah, some people come to the door and they're annoyed. I mean, they don't, they don't look at us like this. They're not going to look at us and say, oh, thou saint of the Most High, you know, thou, thou, thou bearer of glad tidings, you know. They're, they're not going to welcome us in and wash our feet and sit and wait at our every word you know we are i get it there people do get bugged you know they do get annoyed but that's not how i view it whether they know it or not you know there is an ambassador for christ standing at their door you know whether they know it or not someone is offering them eternal life if they would just listen and that's not how god sees it you know god doesn't see us down going well you guys are being a nuisance don't you know it's sunday at two and two in the afternoon right don't you know it's you know next week it'll be don't you know it's super bowl sunday you know, hey, it doesn't start till four. I checked already, okay? So we can get plenty of soul winning in. It's like, yeah, it's pregame. You need to listen to the gospel, buddy. Right? We knock off it for it and go back to church. He says in Jude chapter 1, verse 22, and of some having compassion, making a difference, and others save with weird fear. What? Doing what? Pulling them out of the fire. I mean, that's what we're doing out there. You know, that would probably motivate us a little bit more to go out soul winning or, or when we do go to be, you know, a little bit more, uh, you know, compelled, maybe a little bit bolder, if we could just see it that way, that you're pulling them out of the fire. You know, and I, I don't want to, you know, give kids nightmares or anything like that, but that's the picture that's being described here in the Word of God, that we're pulling them out of the fire. Meaning this, that it's like, it's like they're already on fire. That if they don't get saved, that's their destiny. They might, they might as already come to the door just engulfed in flames. That's how we should see the lost because that's where they're headed. Because that's what hell is. It's hot, you know, it's, it's, it's flame. They're, you know, it's a fiery hell. It's eternal torment. And maybe we should try to see souls like that when they come to the door. You're weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, can I help you? I mean, I know that's what we're hearing in this, in this, in the, you know, this temporal world. But if we learn to look at them through you know, uh, the light of eternity, we wouldn't hear that. We just hear screams of anguish and pain. You know, because that's what they're destined for. Maybe that would motivate us a little bit more. You know, that phrase, pulling them out of the fire, is a little, a little bit more literal than we might think. <coughs> you go back there to Psalms chapter 9, it says in verse 12, When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. Now, he's talking about the wicked, right? He, uh, excuse me, no, he's talking about the righteous. You know, when God says, all right, I'm going to judge, I'm going to avenge now. He remembers who? Those that were oppressed, those that were persecuted. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. You know, and we have to keep this in mind because you hear that so often. Well, why does God let this happen? 
You know, why does God let this bad thing happen? You know, a lot of times God could just turn around and say, why do you let it happen? You know, why, why does God just let people, you know, in this, this hypothetical, you know, uh, bone in the nose guy in the middle of some jungle somewhere has never heard it. Why does he let him go to hell? When God could just say, well, why do you let him go to hell? I mean, I, you, I always run into people like that out when we're out door knocking. They're like, well, I just don't think it's fair that God would send somebody who's never heard to hell. Well, you know, I'm here busy talking to you right now. And after you get saved, I'll tell you what, you can go book a flight. You're so worried about that guy and go get him saved. God could turn around and ask us the same question so often. He says, though, he will not forget the cry of the humble. We might, people might look back and just say, well, God's not involved. No, he hasn't forgotten. But God, you know, he's, he's going he's gonna to judge. It just might not be when we want it. Verse 13, have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate, thee, hate me. Thou liftest up me up from the gates of death. You know, a lot of times the, the trouble that we have, that we suffer, is at the hands of people that hate us. And, 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 <clears throat> and that's what's just so stupid about this whole thing, this whole philosophy out there of, you know, hate's a dirty word. You know, we shouldn't hate. Often the people that promote that kind of line of thinking are the most hateful people. You know, people that have slogans like, keep all Monty friendly, turn out to be the most violent people there are. It's, it's an irony. So, you know, we should never be uh, disheartened, discouraged. You know, let me just break it to you right now that if you, if you love the Lord and you're going to serve Him, you are going to be hated. That just comes, that's part and parcel with the Christian life. That's par for the course. But Jesus said, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. <clears throat> Of course, there is a build-up to that. That's prophetic. He's talking about a time, you know, the end times, uh, you know, it's going to get to that point where we are hated of all men for Christ's sake. But that's not just like a light switch getting thrown on. Like one day everyone's, everyone loves the Christian and, and it's just like everyone hates God or hates him now. Everyone hates the Christians just overnight. There's a build-up to that. I mean, I, I don't think that's much of a stretch to say that. I think anyone that has, you know, any sense about him can look at what's going on in the world today and can see that building up. The hate for the Christian, the hate for God's word, the hate for righteousness, the hate for, you know, the, des the despising of them that are good, as the Bible says. There's a build up to that, so don't let it surprise you. you know? And we've been warned about that over and over again. Jesus said, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. You know, if it hated you, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me uh, before it hated you. So we should not be surprised by that. Look at verse 14. He says there, uh, that I may show forth all thy praises in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy sa salvation. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that, that they made. In the net which they, hit, in the, which they hid is their own foot taken. I just love these verses. <laughs> these are so comforting to know that these people, these enemies that plot against God's people, it's going to just turn around on them. The Lord, verse 16, the Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Haggion, Selah. 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Now there's one little word I want to draw special attention to, and that's the word all. Okay? The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. So if any nation doesn't matter who it is, forgets God, they're going to be turned into hell. Even the good old U.S. of A. You know, and people today, they, they don't like to hear this type of preaching. You know, they, they want to just wave the flag and just eat apple pie and just, you know, God bless America and just, and just think everything's great in this country. You know, and I, and I get it. We have certain rights that other countries don't have. There's a lot of great things, don't get me wrong. And I believe, you know, in the past, this was a godlier nation. People had obviously had higher morals. They, they lived right, more righteously. Even the unsaved, you know, had a higher standard. But that's not where we are today. You know, it doesn't say there that all nations that at one, you know, used to know God, you know, they're going to be spared. So any nation that forgets God, meaning this, that you at one time had to know who God was. You know, that only makes you more accountable. When you have, you know, a Christian, in the, you know, when I say that in the broader sense, obviously, a Christian heritage, that makes a nation more accountable to God. 
So when a nation that used to have that, I mean, look at Israel. They had God's statutes. They had the oracles of God. I mean, they had the, the, the priest. They had everything. You know, God dwelt among them at one point, and they forgot God, and they were har judged very harshly. And it's the same way for us, you know. You know we, I believe that's the same boat that America is in because we do have a Christian heritage, and that has only made us more accountable to God. That, and how does that happen? You know, me being turned into hell. Well, go over to Matthew chapter 25. I believe there's a, a literal interpretation, you know, that's prophetic, that God is going to take entire nations and turn them to hell. But remember, nations are made up of people. So I believe what he's talking about here also is the fact that when a, a people can become so ungodly that it's, that it's entire groups of people that are just cascading into hell. I mean, think about some of the examples we talked about, Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, they were, they were large cities. They was you know, part of a country. And they're just being whole groups of people just turned into hell because they what? Forgot God. Look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then uh, shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate the one from the other as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom, of, uh, a kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And we know the, the, the rest of the story. He says on the left, you know, depart from me. <laughs> he sends them into hell. And they get destroyed. You know, you say, well, that seems harsh. But you know what? That's the way it is with God. God is, if, if people forget God, they despise Him, they cast Him off, they don't want anything to do with Him, then God's just to judge them. God, you know, has every right to turn them into hell. They didn't want to keep God in their knowledge, God gives them up. Look at verse 18. It says, For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish. You say, well, that, that seems a little harsh for God to just... You know, all nations have forgotten to be turned to hell. Don't you think that's, that's a little harsh of God? But why is God doing that? Because a nation that forgets God becomes what? Oppressive. It, 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 it causes suffering and misery. You know, and people that are, we don't, you know, when we live in a prosperous nation, sometimes we don't always see that. We don't always see the, the misery and the suffering that goes on in other parts of the world. You know, we're, the poor here in America are living like kings of old. You know, and I'm not going to go on by like that, about that. But go visit some third world country. You know, go visit some country where they, you know, you make $300 a year. You know, where you can't, where those, those, those countries are being oppressed and held down by other nations that don't know God. I mean, he's saying, look, I'm going to turn these nations into hell. Why? For the needy shall not always be forgotten. God's not going to just turn a deaf ear to the needy. You know, the expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. You know, the poor want vengeance. You know, the godly, the oppressed, those that are being, you know, subjugated by other more powerful nations, you know, unjustly. And, 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 and by the way, that's pretty much, you know, the entire history of man. You know, if you just go through the history, it's just, it's just conquest and conquering and enslaving and destroy, I mean, that's, that's mankind's history. You know, just one nation defeating another, one nation oppressing another, whole groups of people being wiped out, just genocide, people being held down and oppressed. That is man's history. And that's gone on forever, and it will continue to go on until God puts a stop to it. He says, well, that's enough. The needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. <clears throat> and the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 30, there is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. And that's where it starts. You know, they just have no respect, right? There is a generation that is pure in their own eyes. It is not washed from their filthiness. You know, they, they're, they're not, you know they, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. There's nothing wrong with the way we live. There's nothing wrong with our morals. There is a generation, of, oh, how lofty are their eyes. What is that, like a proud look? They're very proud. Their eyelids are lifted up. There's a generation. You know, it, it goes on to describe, and I believe it's all talking about the same generation here. You know, it starts out, you know, they're just, they don't, they curse their father and their mother. They're pure in their own eyes. They're proud. They're lifted up. But what else do they do? 
There's a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. I mean, it's a description of a generation that just becomes so godless that it, and they just become selfish. And it's just all about them, just absorbed in their own selves and what they want at any cost. And it, they don't care if it costs somebody whatever else, you know, if they have to oppress some other country or whatever, as long as they're, they're being taken care of, even at the expense of other people. They'll devour the poor from off the face of the earth. You know, Proverbs chapter 30, that's a, like I said, that's a pretty good synopsis of the history of man. Just one nation devouring another. You know, and that's not me just trying to express some, you know, cliche sentiment, you know. That is the teaching of Scripture. I mean, that's what he's showing us. The wicked rise up, they oppress the poor, and that's the way it is until God steps in finally once and for all and just starts judging the nations and separating them like sheep and goats. So what, you know, what should our take be on that? How should we feel about all this? Well, look at verse 19. O rise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. You know, I read the Bible and it says, hey, God's going to judge the heathen. God's not going to forget the crying of the needy. God's not going to just stand by and, 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 and forget about all those that have been oppressed. You know, God is going to make inquisition for blood. And you know what I say to that? Let the heathen be judged. I'm just glad I'm not on that side. <laughs> I used to be. You know, I, was, you know, I had to get saved. I would have been just like them and for a while probably was in God's eyes. But hey, I got saved. And we, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, look, if we understand that's the, that is the final outcome of the heathen, then let's do our part to bring them over to our side and win them over. But at the end of the day, let the heathen be judged in thy sight. It's a good thing. He says in verse 20, Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. What's he saying? Humble them. You know, and would to God that God would humble this country by any means he needs to. I'm for it. Whatever God has to do to judge this nation. Because if he decides not to and he just lets it go on and go on and this just becomes more wicked and more wicked, you know, God just might say, well, you know what? I'm not going to humble them. I'm not going to bring them back. I'll just destroy them. I'll just judge them once and for all. You know, that should be our prayer for this country. Humble the people of this nation by any means possible, even if it means judgment. Even if it means having to bring this economy to its knees. You know, it just seems like to me that's when people start to seek God. You know, when I first heard that, you know, this coronavirus is going on, I, my, my thought was, well, maybe people will be humble, more open to the gospel. I don't know that's necessarily worked out that way. I mean, man has a way of just kind of digging in his heels anyway. Maybe, you know what it is, is all that stimulus that's going on they quit stimulating everybody with their money, maybe people would be a little bit more open. They'd be like, hey, this isn't so bad. I get a government check every, you know, every three or four months or whatever it's been. I don't know. <clears throat> but you know what? We should have this attitude like David has. There's nothing wrong with desiring to see mankind taken down a notch. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. Because when that happens, people get humble, people get saved. And then ultimately, they don't have to take part in that great white throne judgment. They don't have to end up, you know, in the, piled in with all the goats. You know, why not? We should desire that God should judge them now. We should, you know, let, let the heathen be judged. Let judge them now, you know, before they die and stand before you. You know, think about this. They're going to be judged one way or another, you know, and regardless how we feel about it. You know, God's not going to say, well, I'm, I'm all right. He's going to roll up his sleeve and say, it's time to go to work and start judging the heathen. Let me, let me make sure everybody's okay with that. <laughs> God's not going to check in with us. <clears throat> this is who God is. This is how he works. He judges nations. He destroys people. He brings them low and he humbles them. And all he's really, at, all we should concern ourselves with is that we're there to help people, you know, when they're brought to that place that we can go out and declare, you know, the Lord to them, you know, declare him to these people when they're ready and willing to hear it. Let's go ahead and pray.